All right, well again, good morning, and if it is your first time joining us, welcome to Image Church. My name is Pastor Mike, and it is my absolute honor and privilege to be able to preach the true meaning of Easter to all of you this morning by the grace of God. And so what I want to do first is begin with a reading of Scripture, which is going to serve as our primary text for this morning. I will then pray, ask for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to be upon our time of teaching, and then we'll get in to this morning's message. And I should say afterwards, we're going to have the children's presentation, which I am personally very excited about, and I know you will all be blessed as well. Our text this morning is going to be Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, with particular attention to those last two verses, 10 and 11. We'll have the passage up on the screen behind me, and you can follow along with me now as I read the Word of God. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, I just ask for your blessing, the empowering, convicting, revealing work of the Holy Spirit to be upon all in this place. We pray you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God would speak to us today. We pray that Jesus would be revealed for who he really is, that we might know him. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we all say, amen. So, Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, Jesus Christ, who'd have ever thought, as a pastor, I'd be saying those three names together, on an Easter Sunday. But alas, here I am. Because those three names were proclaimed during this year's Super Bowl in Las Vegas, which was incidentally the most watched telecast in history with 123.4 million average viewers across all platforms. One of the fascinating backstories, even those who are not fans of football but may have been drawn to the game a little bit more than usual, were because there was a backstory, and that backstory was the budding romance between Taylor Swift, who flew in from her tour in Japan, to watch her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, 
of the Kansas City Chiefs as they took on the San Francisco 49ers. And I won't get into who won and how that all went. If you're a 49ers fan, we just want to move on. Let's move on to Jesus. But to the surprise of millions, not one, but two commercials aired during that same game promoting the person of Jesus Christ. These two commercials were a part of a larger campaign designed to reintroduce Jesus to the American public. The chosen slogan of the campaign is, He Gets Us. Following on the surprising success of the chosen streaming series, which highlights the real humanity of Jesus, which, by the way, that show has been partially viewed at least 108 million times and has been translated into 600 languages. The He Gets Us campaign seeks to emphasize that Jesus is able to identify with modern people today, including those who find themselves on the margins of society. And yet, as good as that may be, if Jesus was and is a real person, then the relationship must go both ways. We must not stop at, he gets us. We must then ask, do we get him? And that is the question we began answering last Sunday, and we will continue to do this morning. But there is an inherent danger in attempting to answer this question, do we get him? And that is the danger of imposing our own biases and presuppositions onto the subject so that we arrive at a fictionalized idea of Jesus molded after our own image. What everyone ought to do if they are interested in an honest inquiry into the question, do we get him, is to suspend our own agendas as much as possible. And even to whatever extent we cannot do that, at least to become as consciously aware of our biases as possible. There's a lot of cultural grabbing of the name of Jesus. I actually attended briefly a modernist seminary, we might call it. And by modernist, they teach the Bible, but they don't believe any of it happened and that any of it's real. And it's actually kind of strange, or at least I thought it was strange, that you would spend your whole life going to college, going to graduate school, getting a PhD, to teach a book you don't even believe in. And so I actually asked one professor, why is it you've given your whole life to studying the Bible and teaching it, and you don't believe any of it happened? And her answer was this. Even though I don't believe what the Bible teaches is true, and there's many things in the Bible I don't like and therefore I reject, the name of Jesus has powerful cultural currency. And therefore, if we can capture his name and use it to further our own agendas, we can create the world as we see fit. And so I think it's very important that we all if perhaps not as sophisticated, recognize there's a tendency to want to shape Jesus in our own image. I don't think it's wrong that immediately we see pressing problems in the world today. I don't think it's wrong that we look at our personal lives and we seek to ask the question, how does Jesus relate to me and what I'm going through and my issues I don't think it is wrong to say, look at the problems we're facing as a culture. Look at the problems we're facing on the world stage with international affairs. I don't think it's wrong to ask, what does Jesus have to do with this? But what I am saying is before we get to that, we have to make sure we actually go back first and make sure we've really grasped who the real Jesus is, before we then seek to ask, what does it look like to faithful embody the truth of Jesus today? And so from here, 
as much as we've been able to, setting our own agenda, your presuppositions aside, you're free to pick them right back up when you leave. But I'm just asking, can you set them down for a moment? A lot of people talk today, especially in higher education, about cultural imperialism particularly about how the West and Americans have traveled the world and sort of forced our beliefs and our culture onto people. But I find it quite ironic that those same critics of Western culture will do the same thing to the Bible, an ancient Eastern book. And so I am pleading with you this morning, if just for these 25 minutes, we can set aside those agendas, those biases, set them down, and let us seek to actually pick up what the apostolic biblical witness had to say about Jesus in the context of their world view. Now, when we do that, a surprising thing happens. We discover that despite the diversity present among the New Testament authors, including their grammar, their writing styles, their genres, and their perspectives, they all center themselves around the events of Holy Week. In other words, while many true things could be said about what Jesus did or taught, what defined the heart of Jesus and his mission for the apostles, for those that actually knew Jesus, What defined the center of it all was the events and the meaning behind Holy Week. In fact, scholars use a technical term to identify these essential components. They call it the kerygma. That is, the irreducible core of the apostolic preaching of Christ. Practically, this means that for the apostles... Everything else that Jesus said or did, everything else, is either validated or invalidated on the basis of the events of Holy Week. In fact, even though the four Gospels differ in a number of ways, and many critics call attention to the difference, remember, difference doesn't mean contradiction. If they all got together and colluded and had the exact same story, I'd be suspicious. That, I mean, I got four kids at home. I, I know what's going on when they all have the exact same story, right? There's a problem, I hear a smack, and then all of a sudden crying, and I go into the room. If they all had the exact same story, I'd, I'd be suspicious. Because usually you get different perspectives and angles. We have differences, and yet, listen to this. All four Gospels are in one accord, in assigning preeminence to the events of Holy Week. All of them. It is the most important thing to the four gospel writers. Listen to this, including roughly 33% of the entire gospel of Matthew, 37% of the entire gospel of Mark, 30% of the entire gospel of Luke, and 44% of the gospel of John. Without a doubt, if we asked, what was the most important thing about Jesus? If we want to get him, we must know and understand the events of Holy Week. They are at the very heart of the canonical Gospels. Therefore, it may surprise you that this morning's text is not from any of the four Gospels. Rather, it is a passage from one of the earliest attested letters of the Apostle Paul, which incidentally most scholars contend predates most, if not all, of the Gospels. But I cite it this morning to show you that there is no way any serious attempt to answer the question, do we get him, can be pursued without giving primary attention to the events of Holy Week particularly Jesus' death and resurrection. Palm Sunday definitively identified Jesus as the long-promised Messiah, the King of Israel. But Good Friday and Easter Sunday further define just what type of king Jesus was. 
namely the crucified and risen king. But at this point, many modern critics push back and say, can't we get him equally well or perhaps even better if we just forget all this Holy Week stuff and we just look at his teachings on love, justice, and equity? I came across such a supposition this week during my own personal reflection on Good Friday as I watched The Passion of the Christ for the first time in almost 20 years. As I was watching, the question popped into my mind. What did the critics of this movie have to say back when it came out? One such critic I found who was echoed in kind by many others was David Walsh of the World Socialist website. Didn't know that was a thing, but apparently it is. And this is what he had to say, quote, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ is a deeply repugnant film, but not an insignificant one. Listen to this. While offering no contribution to our understanding of Jesus' life or teaching. Really? None. Or the relation of religion to modern life, it does provide insight into a certain contemporary American mentality and mood. The narrow scope of the Passion of the Christ, listen, renders impossible any serious discussion of Jesus' religious and social message, end quote. Does it really? Is that true? Do the events of Holy Week, and in particular the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, offer us nothing regarding Jesus' life, teaching, and religious and social message? My response this morning is, why don't we let the Apostle Paul answer that question. In the text before us, written approximately 20 years, people that get the idea, oh, legend, do research on how long it takes legends to develop. One of the most basic features of how legends and myths develop is the generation of those that witnessed a thing had to die off, right? Because witnesses sort of are a little bit of a problem when you're trying to develop a legend. They all have to die, and then you develop them later. So it's kind of a problem, for example, that the book of Philippians is within 20 years of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul here asserted before his readers the complete, listen to this, centrality of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus as the defining and validating events of Jesus' entire life including his teachings and his religious and social message, and yes, his other miracles also. So do we want to listen to a modern critic who's not a Bible scholar, who's writing 2,000 years later, or do we want to listen to the people that were actually there? Because again, at this point, I haven't proved anything. I haven't proved that Jesus rose again. But what I am saying is that you cannot read the Gospels or the Epistles, for that matter, and say such an ignorant thing as this movie critic, that the resurrection and death of Jesus have nothing to do with it. As I showed you, it is the bulk of the entire Gospel accounts. Literally, it's kind of like what they start with. Like, here's what we want to say. Holy Week. It's what we want to say. Oh, and we'll build around it for context. It's absolutely what they wanted to say. If we sincerely want to get him, we want to know and understand Jesus, we need to pay close attention to three essential things that Paul says in this passage regarding the death and resurrection of Jesus. They are the centrality of the resurrection, the centrality of the cross, and the centrality of human sin and inadequacy. Number one, the centrality of the resurrection. We look at verse 10a, so that's the first half of verse 10, and then 11 as well. Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. One of the things we first note about Paul is what attracted him to Christianity. In popular culture, either people don't want Jesus 
or if they want him, they want aspects of his social message, right? Is that what Paul was interested in, at least primarily? Does the text say, you know, I heard Jesus teaching on love and fairness and welcoming little kids, and I, I like bread and fish, and like he has lots of that. Oh, that, that sounds great and wonderful. Is that what attracted Paul? The Apostle Paul was already religious. The Apostle Paul already had the Bible at that time, the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. He already had that. He was a moral man, unlike many of us where we give in to our bodily impulses, whatever they might be. We just do what we want to do. The Apostle Paul was a disciplined man. He was so disciplined, many people have compared him to the Roman Stoic Seneca, somebody who believed that you shouldn't just do whatever you feel, that the key to life, the key to a blessed life is discipline, disciplining your body, restraining your your base appetites. Paul was already doing all of that. What Jesus taught, a lot of it in its base form was stuff that was found in the Hebrew Bible that he knew as scripture. But what Paul originally thought of the Christian gospel was that it was an abomination because it proclaimed in it that the Messiah was crucified, a condemned criminal, And this is where worldview matters because Jesus didn't just die. He died the death of the cross. And the death of the cross is not simply a horrendous physical way to die, which of course it was. But you have to interpret the cross within the Hebrew worldview. The cross was a symbol of the curse of God. That is utterly important to know. If you don't get that, you don't get the offense of the cross. You don't get why so many Jews, even to this day, reject it. You don't get why Paul, rather than accepting it, sought to destroy it. You don't get it. The Hebrews had a worldview which included what we call reaping and sowing. Other cultures and religions have Something like that, whether it's karma, you know, you got to put, or just stuff on Facebook. Man, I'm putting out good energy into the world this week. I hope I get some good energy. Like, just, you know, people have this kind of cyclical view of life. The Hebrew Bible contains such reaping and sowing principles. It sets forth the idea that in life, you tend to get back what you put in. You tend to. But it also left room for the fact that sometimes the righteous do suffer. As a matter of fact, not only is that acknowledged in various places, not least the Psalms, you actually have an entire book of the Old Testament dedicated to a righteous man's suffering. It's called the book of Job. And so within that worldview, though they generally recognize reaping and sowing, they also should have seen divine relation said, yes, while there's reaping and sowing, yet there is real inequity in this world. Many people realize that sometimes when you die or you got sick, it was because it was your fault. You did something wrong. You shouldn't have been doing this. You shouldn't have been doing that. You must have cursed God under your breath when nobody was looking. That's why you died. That's how they thought. But they didn't always think that. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, it says that cursed, and cursed means cut off from God, is anyone who dies on a tree. In other words, while they recognize that sometimes things just happened, innocent people could suffer, one way a Hebrew could know that the person suffering was not righteous, but rather they were under the curse of God. They must have done an abominable thing. That is what the cross symbolizes. And the early Christians preached that the curse of God was on Jesus. So you can imagine, if you're an ancient Jew in the first century, why in the world would you naturally believe Jesus was the Messiah? No, the cross rules him out. That's their belief. Think about how hard that is for modern people to grasp when we wear crosses as jewelry. Nothing wrong with that, by the way, but just think about what a radical departure that is from how anyone would have interpreted it in the ancient world. Paul says to the Greeks, the Gentiles, it's foolishness. What a stupid idea. Why would you want to follow a condemned criminal who died on the cross? And to the Jews, stumbling block. Paul uses the word scandal on. It's a scandal. How could you possibly say that a man condemned by God himself, not just the Romans, condemned by God on a tree, how could he possibly be 
the Messiah. And so how did this man, this Jew named Paul, in his own words, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee, a zealous man who knows the Scriptures, who was persecuting Christianity because it preached a cursed man as the way to God. What happened? How did Paul change? The answer is he didn't come across very fascinating moral theories, social ideas. What the book of Acts and even Paul in his own language would tell us is he encountered the risen Christ. He met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, that changed everything else. He didn't start following Christian teaching and adopting Christian ideas, and then eventually, I'll kind of accept Jesus now that I've already been cleaning myself up, living a certain kind of life. No, it was the opposite. He radically came to a realization that Jesus bore the curse of God for us. Yes, he was cursed, but cursed for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so for Paul, the resurrection is central. There's no Christianity without the resurrection. In these two verses, 10a and 11, Paul preaches the resurrection as a past miraculous event, a present power, and a future promise. So first of all, yes, he refers to it as a past historic event that can be studied as such. If you're a skeptic of the historicity of the resurrection, there are volumes, many volumes of research that you can do. It just depends. How much do you want to know? Talk to me afterwards. I'll give you as many books as you possibly want to read. Believe me. And by the way, not everyone needs to know the same amount. Like, how much do we all need to know to come to a decision? It differs, right? Like, over the years, pastoring, I've had people come up to me and say, hey, Pastor Mike, how how do you know when to get married? Like, how do you know you find the one? And it's just... And I, and I give them the same stupid answer I was given. You know when you know. You know when you know. But it's not that stupid, because I, I think once you're there, you kind of get it. But how long does it take? How long should you date? Is it a week? Is it a year? Is it 10 years? Is it, like, how long? And it's like, however long it takes. I hear stories. Seems weird to me. But I hear stories. Some people met, and two weeks later, they're married. To me, not a great idea especially if you're born recently in like the last 20 years. Maybe if you're from the 50s or 40s or whatever, maybe it was a good idea back then. But for how long? Some people, they need to know that person for a year. Other people need to know them for five years. Some people have been dating for 10. It's whatever you need to know in order to make that decision. I would begin by reading the four gospels. Simply read the gospel accounts. There's great books like Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. If you want a shorter one, there's The Case for Easter. If you want to know about the historicity of crucifixion, you can read Martin Hengel's book, The Crucifixion. If you don't mind going into the background, if you've bought into the idea, oh, Jesus is just a myth, and it's it's buying after the ancient Near Eastern myths of dying and rising gods, etc., etc., well, I have an 800-page book for you refuting that. It's called The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. You you want to read the uh, historical, historiographical approach, you can read Michael Lycona's book. However much you want to know. But Paul does open the resurrection to historical inquiry. It is a past miraculous event. However, even many Christians mistake that that's all it is. Notice for Paul in this text, the resurrection is not merely a past historical event. He says, that I may know him now and the power of his resurrection. The resurrection is present power for Christian living. You cannot ultimately do what God is calling you to do unless you experience the power of the resurrection. As a matter of fact, I don't know any more miserable life than trying to fake you're a Christian. Does anybody else know what that's like? I do. I was forced to go to church as a kid. I knew it was the right thing to do, but I didn't want to do it. And then I got into trouble, started reaping and sowing the, the effects of my sin, and then I'm like, okay, I know, I know the Christian way is like a better way than certainly what I'm doing, but I wasn't born again. I did not have the power of the resurrection, and so I, it was almost like putting on a facade. I'll start hanging around Christians. I'll start going to church. I'll try to stop 
saying the F word every five seconds, you know, I'll, I'll like, I'll stop drinking to excess on weekends, I'll stop doing the, like, whatever, and I, and I did some of those things to some extent, but inside, I'm like, I don't belong, I don't belong in these groups, when they're singing songs of Jesus, and they're quoting Bible verses back and forth to each other, and I'm like, gosh, when does this, when does this group end, you know, it's a miserable existence, and I don't want anyone to have to fake that they're in Christ. It'd be better to say, no, I'm not in Christ. I admit that, but I am open to seeking him. It would be better for you to say that because the resurrection means present power. But it is also a future promise. If by any means I may in the future attain to the resurrection from the dead, whether you think it's true or not, it is a fact that the Apostle Paul lived like death was no longer a threat. He wrote this letter, if you didn't realize it, from prison with the possibility of the death penalty hanging over his head. And yet he writes, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul literally believed that because Jesus really, historically, rose again from the dead, so too one day, though he should die, yet he shall live. But number two, we have the centrality of the cross. We don't just skip over Good Friday like it's a little speed bump in the parking lot in order to get to Easter Sunday. Paul says in verse 10b, and the fellowship, the koinonia, the partnership of his sufferings being conformed to his death. For Paul, the cross shapes the entire Christian life. There is no Christian life without the cross. The idea that some of us, indeed any of us, would need to give up some things that we want to do, start doing some things we don't want to do, is not strange territory. And it's not just you even if some Christians happen to point out what you're doing or not doing more than others. There's always sins that come in and out of fashion and culture. But the fact is, the Bible teaches, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us must pick up our cross daily, Christ said, and follow him. The entire Christian life is one of self-denial for the same reason as Paul, that we might know him because the cross is defining of who Jesus is. Lastly, Paul gives us the centrality of human sin and inadequacy. Notice what he says. He says, notice for me, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you. Verse 3, and I have no confidence in the flesh. Again in verse 4, if anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. What Paul is saying, in particularly Jewish language, is simply this. Our best efforts at being moral always fall short of the glory of God. Some of us, we already know that. We gave up a long time ago trying to pretend we're moral people. Some of us, it's good if we're staying out of jail. But there might be some of you, and it'll actually be harder for you than the person on the threat of going to prison. And that's the person who genuinely tries hard to be moral. You generally try hard to be better than other people. And so you believe that if I am better by my standard, I must therefore obligate God, if there is one, to accept me on the basis of what I has done. But what Paul is saying, been there done that. I did everything one could do. And as a matter of fact, if you're trying to be moral, but it's apart from God, you ought to know that's already a fool's errand. You're making up stuff as you go. How do you know God doesn't view your morality as immorality? How do you know? Paul knew because he had the revealed scriptures. They were entrusted to the Jewish people, to ancient Israel. He knew what God required, and guess what? He did it to the best of his ability, but what does he say at the end? His righteousness is rubbish, garbage. 
he recognizes that once he encountered Christ, not a religious system, not mere moral commands, when he encountered the person of Christ, the crucified and risen Christ, suddenly he had what the medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas would call the beatific vision. He beheld that which was more beautiful and precious than anything else. The pearl of great price that Jesus spoke of in the Gospels, that one thing, you're chasing your whole life for pearls, but they're little and imperfect. One day you see that perfect pearl, the one that surpasses all other pearls, the one that is so rich and valuable you can't put a price on it. Paul says, I stopped collecting all these other imperfect things and I gave up everything for the one. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying regarding our sin and inadequacy. Jesus died because our sins necessitated it. What I'm trying to say this morning as succinctly as possible is simply this. Jesus Christ does indeed get us. As fully man, Jesus was able to represent each of us before God. That's why he has to be fully man. Not half man, quasi man, a phantom, or anything else. But the question is, as fully God, do we get him? The apostle John in his gospel says, listen to this, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This means that to get him, we must know him as he is. We must not merely know some of his moral teachings and pick and choose which ones we follow. We must come to know him and worship him as the crucified and risen king, the king who died so you can live. Will you get him today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that it reveals our innermost thoughts and desires. We thank you that you reveal yourself through your word and supremely through the living word, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. We just pray in these closing two songs, this time of response, Lord, that the spirit that raised Christ from the dead would raise us to new life this morning. Lord, let no one feel that their sin disqualifies them. Rather, it qualifies their need for a Savior. Preach to their hearts that we have such a Savior in the God-man Christ Jesus. For those that know him, Lord, remind them to bow their knees. We are always tempted to stand back up on our own two feet and to begin live, to live our own lives, but in his name. Lord, help us to bow the knees of our hearts again and worship him who was crucified, risen, and coming again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.